this is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple, iHeart, Spotify, Podnods, whatever you're listening on. I am Mike Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King and Dion Reed. Penn State Athletics, Kevin Adams, Ball State, Ath Ball State Athletics, Paul Habicott. We're joined tonight by a 12-year NBA veteran, seven-foot center out of Kansas. He played with the Rockets, Warriors, Cavs, Bucks, and Pistons. He'd go on to coach and scout in the NBA for six years, as well as coach in the NBA D League for another seven years. Coach, coach Mo, Paul Mokeski. Paul, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. We're going to be talking centers tonight, top five centers in NBA history. As usual, we'll discuss eight, pick the top five, and, of course, afterwards we'll have our Q&A with Coach Mo. But we're going to start out tonight with Wilt Chamberlain. Hey, Wilt's out of Philly, PA, playing a career that spanned from 59 to 72. He played for the Warriors, 76ers, and the Lakers. The former Globetrotter, this former Globetrotter holds 72 NBA records, 68 by himself. Some of his records are still ones that are considered probably unbreakable in this current NBA, like averaging 22.9 rebounds or a career of 50.4 points per game in a season. Scored 100 in a game, 55 rebounds in a single game, 65 or more points in, uh, you know, 15 times, 50 or more points in 118 times. Um, on March 18th, 1968, completed the only quintuple double in NBA history. It was recorded that Wilt finished the game with 53 points, 32 rebounds, and 14 assists, uh, 24 blocks, and 11 steals. Still, like I mentioned to this day, uh, the only person to score 100, although Lord knows Kobe Bryant tried many occasions to break that. But, uh, you know, in between relationships with about 20,000 women, this dude had a lot of basketball accomplishments. I'll read uh, a couple of the main ones off. Two-time NBA champion in 67 and 72, all-star MVP in 1960, seven-time NBA first team, uh, NBA rookie of the year in 1960, he was a scoring champion, a rebound champion, and an NBA assist leader. Uh, Wilt's, Wilt's one of the all-time greats, in my opinion. Can't forget he was in, uh, was it Conan the Destroyer? I think it was Conan the Destroyer Conan. was the bad guy. <laughs> love that. Love that movie. So, Coach Mo, I, a couple things with Wilt. His legacy obviously goes beyond the game of basketball. We've all heard the stories with Wilt. But, I mean, in your opinion, are we ever going to see a 100-point game again? Is it even possible in today's NBA? And what are your thoughts on Wilt as a whole? Well, I think, you know, we got to remember, you know, back then, and, you know, there's no three-point line. So there's more of a likelihood of that happening now than maybe, you know, 15 years ago because of the three-point line. However, I mean, that feat is, is something else. I don't know if anybody, you know, I mean, you know, great, great scorers, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, uh, just to name a, a few, LeBron, whatever, uh, you know, the closest they've come is like 20 points. So, you know, with a three-point line. So, uh, you know, uh, whether it'll be broken, I doubt it, along with him averaging, um, what do you average, 50, 50 rebounds? No, what, 30 rebounds in a season? Or he grabbed 50 rebounds or, you know. Yeah, uh, he had a, I think he had a 50 rebound game. Yeah, I mean, five rebounds box, in a single game. Yeah. You know what? One of the biggest records, and, you know, obviously I'm a little biased because I'm a KU guy and Wilt was a KU guy. And, you know, I, I was the first seven-footer to Kansas since Wilt Chamberlain back in the day. Um, so I know him really well. I actually got a chance to play against him uh, in pickup games at Pepperdine University at, about 10 years after he had retired. Um, but... Uh, you know, I mean, the one of the biggest things that I think of, he had over 118 times he scored 50 or more points in a game. Mm -hmm. That will never be broken. I mean, you can add, put Kobe and MJ and LeBron and throw three more guys in there, and they don't even come to 100. So, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, you know, he has um, uh, so many records that are still standing that – you know, when I, I did research for this and, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a big man and I, and I look back and I was trying to find somebody, anybody that could compete with him individually and be, with the records and the statistics, there are none. Um, 
And people don't realize the athlete he was. I mean, he ran track and did high jump at KU. He played professional volleyball, both on the beach and indoor. He raced uh, uh, race cars. I don't know how he got in the race cars, but he raced them. And uh, he was just, uh, when you watch a footage of him when he was with the Globetrotters, I mean, he was bringing the ball down the floor. He was passing it. Now, I don't know if he'd ever get a three-point shot, but, you know, if, if you're talking about scoring, rebounding, block shotting, and assist, he is the only center that led the NBA in assists for a season. The only one. And I mean, you're he's talking gotta about... Be, he's got to be considered one of the most well-rounded players ever, right? Yeah, and, and athletic. I, tell me someone I was more athletic. I don't care who you, who you say, and... Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, everybody, in my opinion, when you're talking about the best ever, you need to talk about the individual player, not the championships. Now, he has two championships, you know, and, and you know, someone we'll talk about later has more and, and a few have more. But uh, team championships, there are team championships, depend on the team you're on. You could be the best player in the NBA and never, never win a championship because you're on a bad team. <laughs> you know, so you know, I, I just uh, everything he did, finger roll. He had the, you know, I, I coached in Dallas for five years and I got to coach with Dirk Nowinski on the team, and everybody thinks that Dirk uh, did the old one foot fadeaway little little shot in, in the three quarter post. And he even is going to have a statue in front of the arena in Dallas of that one footed fadeaway. Wilt did that way before him. He was doing it uh, on an unbelievable clip back then. So, uh, you know, he ticks all the boxes off for me. Uh, I, I, you know, you know, maybe the uh, women <laughs> might've slowed him down, but, but he also played every game. And played almost every minute of every game. So, <laughs> well, let's move on to uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh wait, let me let me tell oh, you yeah. one more. Go ahead. Yeah. Will Chamberlain. Uh, people that uh, don't know out there in the NBA, there's a thing called a shoot around, and that's usually about ten or eleven o'clock in the morning, the day of a game. And you go to the arena and you get some shots up. You loosen up, and then you go over the scouting report of the uh, team you're going to play that night you know, the personnel, and then you go home and you get rest and you come to the game. Well, uh, I, uh, the coach of the Lakers, when Wilt was playing for the Lakers, was the first person to put in the shoot-around, you know? And uh, Wilt said, went to him, uh, and when he decided to do the shoot-around, said, hey, listen, you can have me for two hours a day. Do you want him at 11 o'clock in the morning or you want him at 7 o'clock at night? So Wilt never went to a shoot-around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't need it. <laughs> Dion, go ahead. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. All right. Uh, how about Mr. Kareem? Um, born in New York, New York, uh, formerly known as Ferdinand Lewis Alcindor Jr. <clears throat> Kareem uh, had some of the uh, coolest nicknames, you know, Lou, Cat, Murdoch, Big Fella, Kareem the Dream. He was the first overall pick in the 1969 draft out of UCLA by Milwaukee. Went on to have a 20-year career, six years with Milwaukee and 14 with the LA Lakers. Um, stood about seven foot two, played at a, around the weight of 220, 25 pounds. Um, was famously known for one of the most famous shots in NBA history with the Scott Hook. Uh, in his 20-year career, he played uh, 1,560 games, averaged 24.6 points per game, averaged 11.2 rebounds with 3.6 assists and 2.6 blocks a game. In that 20-year career, he uh, went on to have 19 all-star appearances, a two-time scoring champion. Uh, he was the 1975 rebounding champ champion, a four-time blocking champion, um, helped his team win six NBA championships, five, uh, I'm sorry, 15 NBA um, All-Star appearances. Uh, he was 11-time All-Defensive Player selection. He won the Rookie of the Year, was on the Rookie of the Year um, roster, two-time NBA Finals MVP. Uh, he was a six-time MVP. He made 
uh, all of other anniversary teams, the 35th, the 50th, and the 75th anniversary team. And, of course, we know him as the all-time scoring leader. And my case, my final case for him being the best center is the team that he was playing on. As Coach Mo had just talked about, you know, it takes a team to win the championship. And, some of the, you know, the Showtime Lakers, you think about all the greats that he played with, and he was still able to be an all-time scoring leader. Um, I think that says a lot. So he was able to bring that championship title to Milwaukee. Then he goes on to L.A., and they eventually become Showtime, of course. But uh, your, your thoughts on Kareem, like, he was kind of like one of those big first name players to, to make a move from a city to a city that I remember, at least. So what are your thoughts on Kareem? Yeah, that was, uh, if I remember it right, that was, I, I think it was like eight players for one. <laughs> I think it was, you know, and, and that was just a huge move, and, you know, I, I grew up watching uh, Lou Alcindor slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in California, and I watched UCLA ever since I was a little kid and, and just watched him, you know, play in those legendary teams. And, you know, he went to Milwaukee and brought them a championship on not so great a team. They had Oscar Robertson, but then a bunch of role players. Uh, and then, you know, pretty much kind of did his job and, and uh, he just really didn't fit in in Milwaukee, uh, like someone like me who played there for eight years might. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of didn't, didn't demand, but kind of asked, you know, to be moved to, uh, you know, to L.A., a, be a better area. And quite frankly, it was better for everybody because Milwaukee probably couldn't afford him anyway. And, uh, you know, uh, you talk about that sky hook. I mean, um, I came, when I came in the league as a rookie in 79, and, and uh, you know, I, I would – just watch that thing. I would guard him and I would look at it and just marvel at it till after about two years, some of my teammates said, Hey Mo, you got to guard that guy. You can't just watch him shoot a skyhook all day because <laughs> it was so pretty and beautiful. And his touch, he could shoot that skyhook from 18 feet out. The people don't realize that he, he had that touch and it's not a good, it's not an easy thing to accomplish. Um, he, he was kind of, it was known, you know, you try to push them around and be physical with them, you know, but no matter how big you were, strong you were, you know, he would, he could just get around you. He knew his position, you know, how to get his body where it needed to go and get to his left shoulder and, uh, you know, uh, shot blocking when he wanted to. The one kind of weakness that I think uh, um, that Kareem had, you know, is his rebounding. So, you know, you look at, his rebounding um, over the years, and you know he his career best was 17. That's phenomenal, you know. But he he averaged about 10 or 11 rebounds, which isn't bad, you know, for somebody. But you know that's kind of where I see his downfall just a little bit, and also his passing. He was a good passer, um, you know. He averaged like three or four assists, maybe five with the with the Magic Johnson teams. But uh, you know, just a phenomenal. You know, when you got a, a move named after you, you're pretty good. <laughs> well, let's move on to the dream. All right. Another guy with a move named after him. Uh, we got Hakeem Olajuwon, seven foot tall, 255 pounds out of Nigeria. Uh, in 1984 to 02, he played with the Rockets and with the Toronto Raptors. So Hakeem the Dream, he started out with the University of Houston, teamed up with Clyde Drexler to form Five Slamma Jamma. Uh, both of them could could dunk effortlessly, so that's where the name came from. Um, uh, the uh, the Akeem the Dream. So Akeem was the 1983 NCAA Tournament Player of the Year, and he led Houston to the championship game that year. So then he's drafted first overall by the Rockets in the '84 draft, and he was paired up with R Ralph Sampson to become the Twin Towers for a few years. Uh, over the length of his career, Akeem stacked up the accolades: 12-time All Star. Six-time first-team All-NBA, uh, three-time second-team All-NBA, and he nine times he was on the All-Defensive Team, uh, two-time Defensive Player of the Year, and Andy led the association twice in rebounds, three times in blocks. Uh, when Hakeem got the ball uh, in close or in mid-range, he was deadly. Uh, he had a nearly unstoppable move called the Dream Shake. He could catch the pass 
or the rebound um, with both feet on the ground, shoulder fake in either direction, pivot back in the opposite direction, add in some pump fakes or pivots if necessary, and then finish with the jumper or the layup. Uh, 1993-94 was, uh, in my opinion, Hakeem's most amazing season and really one of the best in NBA history because he was the NBA MVP during the regular season, and then he led the Rockets to an NBA championship, and he accomplished this with exactly zero NBA All-Stars on his roster, uh, other than himself, of course, and that's something that's only been done a couple other times. Uh, the following year, the, uh, the Rockets added Clyde Drexler, and then they won it all again. They ran it back. So Hakeem Olajuwon, one of the very best centers of all time and one of the very best overall players of all time. Look at the question that comes up with Hakeem. If Jordan doesn't go play baseball, does he have any rings? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, one thing that uh, – I, I, I played against uh, Hakeem for about three or four years – and uh, one thing I, I, you know, they have li have them listed at seven foot tall. And when I played, I was about seven foot and a quarter. In my opinion, uh, he was closer to six eleven, maybe six ten. Uh, in my opinion, and that makes all his accolades even more impressive. <clears throat> he was one of the first centers uh, to have his footwork, you know, the quick footwork, um, you know, his uh, shake that he had when I guard him. I used to wait and let him shake a couple times and wait for him to come back to me. And hopefully I got it timed the right way. But, uh, you know, his footwork was, you know, from when he was a child and he played soccer. So, uh, you know, he he was, uh, you know, most centers were thought of be back then to be plodding and kind of slow. And he was more quick-footed and more agile. Uh, one of the things that stands out, too, is uh, he has the most steals by a center ever in the game. And he – he could not only block shots on defense, but he could steal the ball. He was really quick and had good hands. Uh, and he could change a game in many, many ways, um, you know, uh, with his presence on offense and defense. And uh, his tenacity, too, is what I remember. Um, you know, he he was one of the best ever to, to play. And uh, I think he's overlooked a lot. Of, I believe he was one of the first to have a recorded quadruple double with 18 points, 16 rebounds, 10 assists, and 11 blocks. And I would rewind that game. I bet he had 10 steals, too. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive numbers. We'll never know the what if with the Jordan factor, but uh, just, just an all-around great player. Let's, uh, let's go to the, to the guy tonight who's got the most titles, Bill Russell. <laughs> yeah, Bill Russell played for the Celtics from 56 to 69. Um, he was captain of the gold medal winning team uh, at the 56 Olympics as well. He's a five-time NBA MVP and 12-time All-Star. He was a part of the Celtics dynasty that won 11 NBA championships. And that was during his very, actually, pretty. it was a pretty short career of 13 years. So he only lost a championship or didn't win a championship two seasons that he played. Uh, he's tied for the record for the most championships won by an athlete in a North American league. That's never going to be touched ever again. Um, he dominated his position with his defensive play. Um, he was six foot ten. His wingspan was over seven feet. His shot blocking and man to man defense was a big reason why the Celtics dominated. Um, he was also great at rebounds. He led the NBA in rebounds four times. He had 12 consecutive seasons of a thousand or more rebounds and his second all time in total rebounds at 21,620 and rebounds per game at 22 and a half, ranked second in both of those categories. Him and Wilt are the only two players to have gotten 50 rebounds in a single game. He was also a player coach from 66 to 69, which they won three championships during that time. Uh, in 2011, Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom because of his accomplishments on the court and off. Uh, he was inducted into the Naismith Memorial and National Collegiate Hall of Fame. He was selected uh, into the NBA 25th, 35th, 50th, and 75th anniversary teams. He was named one of the 50th greatest players in NBA history, one of only four players to receive all three of those honors. In 2021, he was named to the 75 greatest players in NBA history. He, he was enshrined into the FIBA, FIBA Hall of Fame, and the NBA actually renamed the MVP Finals uh, trophy after him and is now the Bill Russell NBA Finals MVP. Um, and then in 2021, he was also inducted into the Hall of Fame for his coaching career. 
Uh, Celtics retired his number. Sports Illustrated listed him as the third best center of all time and eighth best player uh, in the league history. He definitely is top three, at least. So, so Coach Mo, you mentioned earlier that it's not necessarily rings that are going to define his greatness, but but with Bill Russell, it's hard to not look at that number and say, wow. I mean, so your thoughts on this big man? Well, I know, uh, you know, the rings speak for themselves, and you brought it up what I was thinking about, too. To win a championship as a player coach is so hard because you, you have to know, you know, substitutions and all this stuff. Now, it wasn't as complicated back in that day. You know, you play the guys, you play, I got this guy, I got that guy. But you have to be a leader. That tells about what kind of leader he was. To be a player coach and win championships, come on. Uh, but uh, it also tells, I mean, his rebounding, when I look at, you know, I coached for 20 years and I look at stats that carry over from college to the NBA or FIBA overseas or wherever. And one of the stats that kind of carries over pretty solid is rebounding. And that's what he was. He, he averaged 23 rebounds a game for his whole career. And that's pretty something that you can't, you know, he blocked shots. He was another uh, uh, earlier big guy that was athletic, run the floor. He could block a shot at one end and sprint down and dunk it at the other end with a lob. He's one of those guys. And, uh, you know, he only played 13 years and he has, you know, a lot of the different uh, records, but the championships are what stand out. The team he played on was phenomenal. You know, you talk about Bob Cousy and those guys. And, uh, you know, they helped win a lot of championships. So, I, you know, I know it's great, but if you're talking about individual players, you know, and it kind of uh, it, it carries over into his scoring average. He is the least scoring center that we're going to talk about today. He averaged, 19, he averaged 15 points a game uh, for his career. His best season, he averaged 19 points a game, not even 20. So that, that has to do with his unselfishness and the way he played defense, but also the Hall of Famers that were on his teams to win those championships. That's why Kevin didn't throw out those individual stats. He knows how to argue. Ooh, <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish they counted blocks because uh, they didn't count blocks at yeah. that time for him. Yeah, so who knows how many blocks the dude had. True. And he, true. And he actually uh, kind of uh, not created, but kind of perfected the time where when you're a center, instead of swatting the ball out of bounds and then the team gets it back, he would tip it to either himself, block it and tip it to himself, or one of his teammates to start a break. And that was how smart he was. Let's go to the Admiral. Yeah, great nickname for a great man who epitomizes a role model. He's probably the best basketball player in Naval Academy history. And a very rare NBA player, at least in the modern NBA, to play for all one team. O2, um, he played for the 89 02 03 season with the Spurs. Two time NBA champion in 99 and 03. NBA most valuable player in 95. 10 time All Star. Uh, sportsmanship award, scoring champion, rebound leader, blocks leader, rookie of the year, NBL first uh, rookie first team, uh, USA basketball male athlete of the year, two-time Olympic gold medalist. But um, overall with David, I would just say I challenge anybody, like even the most negative person that I know in my life, Kevin, uh, to, to say something negative about David Robinson in addition to this NBA career he had, and he, he might have retired a little early. I don't know. We can talk about it. But uh, there's stories out there about him, you know, visiting fifth graders at Gates Elementary School in San Antonio and challenging him to finish school and go to college. And he offered $2,000 in scholarship to everybody who did. And in 98, proving even better than his word, he awarded 8000 to each of those students who compete, completed his challenge. He's got um, the NBA cre created a plaque, David Robinson plaque, for some of the community service he did and leadership that he exhibited in 2011 in recognition of his uh, efforts with the Carver Academy. He received the Children's Champion Award uh, for um, creating, you know, um, topics of conversation around children's hunger. And then uh, he became a member of the V Foundation for Cancer Research. So, I mean, this guy on and off the court, if you combine both, I think that's where his legacy comes from. The reason I was pausing there is just I have about 15 more stories I could read of 
just philanthropy he's done over his career. So that's Dan Robinson in a nutshell, I think. So part of the Twin Towers there with Tim Duncan. Uh, couldn't win a title until he got Duncan. So he can't claim what Hakeem claimed. Hakeem did it by himself that first season. Robinson needed the help on Duncan with Duncan. But your, your thoughts on Robinson? We, we know he's, he's a great guy on and off. I actually think he's a little underrated. Um, he's often not mentioned in, in these lists when you hear them. So what, what are your thoughts, Coach Mo? Well, David, David was uh, another great athlete, and he was probably, of all the centers we're talking about, he was the most cut of the centers. I mean, he looked like he was strong. At 7'1", 240 was all muscle, uh, and, and he could run the floor. I agree with you. He's overlooked. His career, he averaged 21, 11, and 3. In his best season, he had 30 points, 11, and 5 assists. So, you know, he, he's right up there. He did score 81 points in a game, too, by the way. So, uh, you know, he, the guy could play. The other thing, a twist for other people out there that don't realize, he was, he was left-handed. And for a post player to be left-handed, it's more than, of an advantage than you think because post players are habit guys. And you know most post players turn over their left shoulder because they're right-handed, and that's how they like to score. When you get a lefty, he turns over the other shoulder, and you're always thrown off a little bit, and, and that helped him. Um, but off the court, one of the best guys ever. I was in the Spurs training camp with him uh, for a few weeks. A great guy. One of the biggest things I think he, he did and showed his how unselfish he was and how good a teammate he was for his organization, the Spurs, is he when they brought Tim Duncan in, David Robinson was at the top of his game or right there, maybe coming down a little bit. So he could have been a jerk. He could have said, this is my team. It's always been my team. And it's going to be my team as long as I'm here. And, uh, you know, maybe we don't be as successful as we could. Instead, he said, well, let me bring this young player along, Tim Duncan, uh, one of the best power forwards ever, and let him be the focal point. Let him have the spotlight. I'll do my thing, and I'm going to let him do it. And together, we can be su successful and actually win championships. And that's one of the biggest things of his legacy in my mind. Well, let's move on to who, my, in my opinion, is probably the biggest star of everybody we're talking about tonight, Shaq. <laughs> the Shaquille O'Neal out of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, first overall pick in the 1992 draft out of LSU, uh, led by Orlando. Uh, if this was a conversation about who had the best nicknames, we could stop right now. Um, <laughs> Diesel, the Big Aristotle, Superman, uh, Shaq Fu, uh, Daddy, <laughs> Warrior, the Big Cactus, the list goes on. Um, he played at seven foot one, uh, around 325 pounds, which is not easy to move on a basketball court. Um, one of the most physically demanding athletes probably in sports history, if you think about it. I mean, no one's really played with that type of mass, uh, not with that arm reach and moving that weight up and down the court. Um, he's probably one of the toughest uh, guys to referee because he was so physically imposing. 19-year uh, career. He was a 15-time All-Star, four-time uh, NBA champion, went to the All-Star game 14 times. Uh, the 92 Rookie of the Year, also uh, first team all rookie selection. Um, he was a three-time All Defensive Player, three-time All Star um, All Star Game MVP, three-time three-time Finals MVP, two-time Scoring Champ, which is not easy to do in, in the 21st century. Um, he was uh, on the 75 and the 50th. Uh, year anniversary team, and he made the 50th year team only five years in the league. Uh, we want to talk about big-time players show up in big-time moments. He was voted as one of the, the best NBA Finals performances um, the year 2000, where he averaged 38 points per game, 16 boards, two two and a half blocks, two 2.3 assists, or 61% shooting. Um, he's, he's had some of the uh, one was unbreakable records uh, up until Mr. Dwight Howard, but he was uh, one of the youngest to reach 1K, 2K in, 3K rebounds. Um, one of the fewest to do a 40-point and 
20 rebound games. Um, he was the most, uh, more, had most seasons leading, uh, consecutive years of leading the league in rebounds. Uh, he tied with uh, Mr. Will Chamberlain with that as well. Um, he had also had a career earnings of $290 million, $146. So, and you just think about Shaq, again, what, some of the players that he's played with, he's out, helped them accelerate their, their careers. Penny Hardaway, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, he's helped LeBron, you know, try to get to a title run as well. Um, you know, it's not easy being a big guy in today's game, and he certainly paid this way. So, Coach Mo, we, we can't bring up Shaquille O'Neal without mentioning hack shack and the foul mm -hmm. shooting. Uh, when we had Rick Barry on the show, he, he said he tried really hard to get Shaq to try those underhand free throws. I mean, if this guy was sinking 50 60% of his free throws, his points per game would be even higher. So what are your thoughts on Shaq, and, and should they have maybe tried something different with his foul shots? Well, um, I know Rick pretty well. I know he is very delicate telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, you know, and uh, Will Chamberlain was a poor free throw shooter also. Uh, the problem is with when you have poor free throw shooting, at the end of the game when they foul you, it's a, it's a detriment to your team. And that was always, a, you know, the hack of shack and – holding him back and do we leave him in the game and he gets pissed off or whatever. Uh, you know, that was, a you know, a downfall. And, you know, I know Rick likes the underhand and my dad shot the underhand and I don't blame. Actually, Rick's son is in the G League now shooting underhanded free throws and shooting about 90%. And uh, I think Shaq was too prideful to change his free throw. Uh, and he didn't want to look silly because, uh, you know, despite I'm seven foot tall, I'm 300 now and, you know, we've been stared at all, all our lives, and we don't like to look funny when people, you know, they're going to stare at us anyway. I think if I would have had anything to do with it, I would have told Shaq, let's try to bank the bank in free throws. Bank the free throw in. Yeah. Uh, over in, when I went to Korea and coach for a little bit, they learn how to shoot free throws. They bank them in. And the thought process is uh, if it's too long, it can still go in. It can bank in. And, uh, you know, I would – but he wasn't going to change his free throws for no, for nobody, especially when people started harping on it. But he was one of the most powerful players ever to play the game, and he got fouled more than he got fouled called on him because little guys always get to hit the big guys and they don't call fouls because <laughs> they're little guys. Uh, and he – you know, he, he – you know, he was – but he had a better touch. He had a good left and right hook. And there's two things that stand out to me about Shaq. Uh, you know, the one thing is, um, you know, he, he was one of the most powerful players and still athletic when he was in shape. One little question mark for me on that is, when you get a great player like that, you know, I'm not naming name, uh, any names, but maybe uh, Harden, how, how come you're on so many different teams, you know, in your career? Uh, you know, I know today's is, is different. But the one uh, – the, so there's one thing that really makes me mad about him is – he was on the Miami team with Dwayne Wade when I was with the coaching staff in the Dallas Mavericks, and we had them down 2-0 going to Miami, and they won the last four games in a row, and he cost me a championship ring. The thing I really like about Shaq is he's one of the guys on TNT, when they show Barkley punching me in the playoffs, he defends me. So I like Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Shaq's just fun to watch, but uh, let's, let's move on. We, we talked about uh, how great David Robinson is, is, was, is off the floor. Shaq is that also. I live in Las Vegas. Shaq lives here now. He's given to schools and programs and all this stuff. He's always done his Christmas giveaways where he dresses up as Sam and go. So he's also one of those guys that is phenomenal uh, off the floor. Let's go, Moses Malone. All right, moving on to Moses Malone here. Um, six foot ten, two hundred sixty pounds, out of Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, in nineteen seventy four to nineteen ninety five, he played with several teams, including the Rockets, Sixers, Bullets, and Hawks. So long before LeBron James, there was another superstar who went from high school straight to the pros. 
So Malone, he joined the ABA after graduating high school um, initially, and then he was named the ABA All-Star in his rookie season. Uh, he went to the NBA after that and quickly became one of the impact players of the association. He was an All-Star in 12 consecutive seasons from 1978 to 1989. Uh, he was an All-NBA first team four times, All-NBA second team four times, and he won the N NBA MVP award in 79, 82, and 83. Uh, he was a high-level defensive player. He was named to the uh, All-NBA defensive team twice. Um, he led the NBA in rebounds six times. Um, and for his rebounding prowess, he earned the nickname Chairman of the Boards. Uh, Moses was a tireless player. He twice led the NBA in minutes played per game. Uh, he used his elite physicality to rack up very impressive numbers. First um, in offensive rebounds in NBA history, uh, 27th in career blocks, uh, eighth in defensive rebounds, 10th in points. And you take out the non-centers and he's top five all time. Uh, his numbers retired by both the Sixers and the Rockets. And in 82-83 was perhaps his best season. He won the NBA MVP. He led the Sixers to the finals. They swept Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Showtime Lakers. And Moses out-rebounded Kareem 72-30 to in that series and was named the finals MVP. So that's Moses Malone. So Coach Malone, he comes in the league 18 years old, straight out of high school. You're not at your physical peak yet at that age. And to be a center, which in my opinion is the most physically pounding position, how, how does someone that young stand up to what's coming at him? Well, um, Moses Malone, uh, God rest his soul, was, uh, was a mentor of mine. When I was a rookie, I was drafted in the second round by the Houston Rockets, and Moses Malone was their starting center and MVP. Now, they had a veteran team of you know, Calvin Murphy and Rudy Tomjanovich and Rick Barry was actually on that team and Calvin Murphy. Uh, but Moses is the one that, you know, I played behind Moses. So uh, I got to play about four minutes a game because he played the rest of the game and never fouled out of a game. Uh, but I learned more guarding Moses in practice than I did in my 12 years in the NBA playing in games because uh, he was just phenomenal, a great individual, uh, really quiet. Uh, quite frankly, he was hard to understand because he mumbled a lot and, and people didn't really understand him uh, that much. Had a huge heart. One word that tells me about Moses Malone, relentless. He was relentless. He played hard all the time. He was relentless on the rebounding and on the glass, especially the offensive glass. When I was a rookie in Houston, uh, Moses Malone averaged, I think, 15 or 16 rebounds a game. And five or six of those were offensive. And I asked my coach, uh, Del Harris, um, who was coaching that team, I said, and he's actually, he's one of the smaller guys we're talking about. He was 6'10", but he didn't have a seven-foot arm span. He had regular arms and little hands. I said, coach, how does he get all those offensive rebounds? He said, he said, Mo, I'll tell you. Most players in the NBA, uh, power forwards and centers, go after 50% of the rebounds that they can. That means when I'm on the floor and the ball goes up, they go off about 50% of those rebounds. We chart Moses Malone, and he goes over 90% of those rebounds. Even the ones people say, well, I can't get I'm not going for him. He goes for him and might get one or two. So he was a relentless player. Uh, and he could score on the post in really uh, uh, unusual ways. You know, get his rebound, put him back. When he when he got the MVP, he thanked his teammates because he led the league in rebounding because they missed so many shots. He said, thank <laughs> you for missing so many shots that I could get your rebounds. But uh, I'll tell you a short story. When I was guarding him in practice, I was a rookie, didn't know what I was doing. You know, I'm guarding him behind. I got my arm bar and my hand up, and I'm physical with him. And he, the basket is behind me. He throws it over his right shoulder, spins around me, and gets the rebound off the backboard and lays it in while I was just standing there. Because who does that? He does that because he was that creative with his with his moves. In my opinion, in my 12 years in the NBA, and I played Kareem, and I played some of the best, he was the, the hardest center to guard because he was unpredictable. Kevin McHale was the hardest power forward to guard because they, he was unpredictable. And Moses uh, was one of the best ever. Well, our final center tonight, 
Patrick Ewing. Yeah, Patrick was a that dude was a beast at, at shot blocking. He had great size, strength down low. Uh, he had a scoring touch in the post and out of mid range. Uh, he played most of his career starting center for the the New York Knicks. Uh, before ending his career, though, he did have some brief stints with the SuperSonics and Orlando Magic. Uh, he had a 17 year NBA career, so he had some some longevity there. Uh, where he is an 11 time All Star and named the seven All NBA teams and three all-defensive second-team selections. He got Rookie of the Year in 86 and was named to the all-rookie team that year as well. He helped take the Knicks to two NBA Finals in 94 and 99. Unfortunately, you know, around that time, there was a lot better teams than than the Knicks <laughs> that he was going up against. Um, but, yeah, he won Olympic gold medals in 84 and 92. He was selected as the 50 uh, greatest players in NBA history in 96, and then the 75 greatest players uh, in 2021. He's a two-time inductee into the Basketball Hall of Fame. So as an individual player for his career, and then in 2010 as a member of the 1992 Olympic team where he won his second gold medal. Um, additionally, he was uh, inducted into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame and a member uh, as a member of the Dream Team in 2009. His number was retired by the Knicks in 2003. He's considered by many as one of the greatest centers of all time. He averaged 21 points per game, 9.8 rebounds uh, per game, and two and a half blocks per game. And only three players that we talked about tonight ranked better in blocks per game than him. Uh, he ranks seventh in blocks in N NBA history with almost 3,000. He is top 25 in rebounds with over 11,600 and 24th in scoring in the history of the NBA. David Robinson wasn't in the top 25 for either one of those categories, Paul. So I just had to get that in there. But Patrick Ewing, he was a great player, great size. Definitely has a shot. I, I think he has an argument to be there. Great college career at Georgetown, too. Yeah. Uh, Coach Mo, so with Ewing, he played in New York. Everybody knows that everything in New York is magnified 100 times more. He <laughs> didn't get the ring there. If he did, I mean, he might be mentioned as maybe – top three if, if, if he gets a ring in New York just because it's New York. So your, your thoughts on Ewing? Uh, Patrick was, again, one of the hardest workers. When you when you played uh, Patrick, you're going to have a long night, just like if, if you played Moses Malone, because they, they played hard all the time. You know, when if there was a side, sidebar. When I watch NBA games now, nobody's sweating. No one's sweating. There are so many timeouts, or they're not, they're just too smooth. When you played Moses Malone or Patrick Ewing, those guys were sweating because they were working really hard. And Patrick had, like, like you said, uh, really good timing on his uh, uh, shot blocking. Uh, and he also had what's underrated that people don't say he had a great one two step running hook into the paint. That was his shot. And then later in his career, he stretched out his range to about, you know, 17, 18 feet. He could knock down that jump shot. And in today's game, he's one of the guys we're talking about that I believe could have stretched out to the three-point line eventually. So, uh, you know, he, you know he, he, he didn't win a championship. A lot of people put a lot of negative stuff on him. But And then another guy that's a great human being. I'll tell you a side story there, too. I was playing in 91 – uh, for the Golden State Warriors, my last year in the league, uh, we run TMC, and we had a decent team. You know, we, we won a couple playoff series, but, you know, we're playing in the garden. And, uh, you know, I, went, I was a backup guy, backup to a backup, and I guarded Patrick pretty well. So Don Nelson put me in the game, and I did a really good job. And at the end of the game, it just so happened that it was a tie game, and I was guarding Patrick. They gave him the ball on the on the elbow, and he did his uh, one-two dribble hook, and I actually grabbed it and stole it from him, and the time went out, run out. We were up by two, and we won the game. And then uh, in the hut, in the locker room, it's really small in the garden. And, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, pat back up, and all of a sudden all these TV cameras are around me, and they're, and they're going, hey, you, you made the steal on, on Patrick, you know, and won the game, and, and, you know, and I go, well, what did Patrick say? He said, you made a great play, stole the ball, and won the game. You know, he didn't have to say that. But, uh, you know, he's just a, a super guy and a super person. So before we move into our vote, real quick, our shout-outs, Willis Reed, Bill Walton, just missed the list and got to throw out 
the OG, the original gangster here, uh, George Mikan, first mm-hmm. NBA star, really, uh, it, that there ever was. And, well, you know what you know what Shaq you know what Shaq's quote is, right? About Mikan. No, no. His his quote is without good old number ninety nine. That's his number. There would be no Shaq. That's his quote. There you go. First guy to three P too. So just uh I would have had him on the list, but uh, I'm not a panelist tonight, just hosting. So let's move into our vote. Can't vote for your own guys. Top five. Paul, who are you taking? You know, I'll go ahead and I'm gonna venture out and do Shaq on this one. I'm gonna go vote for Shaq. Shaq. All right. Dion. Yeah, I I, I had to take into consideration the, the era he played in. He didn't really have much to look up after um, or look up to. So I'm going to just go with Will. Okay. Brian? Um, I think you, I think you got to have Kareem on here. I mean, six-time MVP. I know he had to, I know he had a good team around him, but, I mean, he, he, he did it by himself pretty much in Milwaukee too. So you got to go Kareem. Kevin? Jeez. Um, man, I can't vote for Bill Russell because I represented him. Thanks for clarifying. Um, what about David Robinson? Since you, I'm gonna, uh, have, to go with, I'm gonna have to go with Hakeem. Hakeem Olajuwon. So, Coach Mo, we come to you. You got choice of Moses Malone, Bill Russell, David Robinson, or Patrick Ewing. Um, I mean, all great players, all play their position unbelievable. But in my opinion, it's not even close. It's Wilt. He has 80 records. He oh, scored 100 points in the game. So, so we got we got Wilt on there already. So you get to pick the one of the ones that's left. Oh, I can't pick Wilt. Well, he's <laughs> he's already on the list. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I I picked George Mike in then. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put Moses Malone on that list then. Nice, good choice. I'm put Moses. All right, so legacy battles top five centers of all time: Hakeem Olajuwon, Will Chamberlain, Shaquille O'Neal, Moses Malone, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Let's move into our Q and A, and we got uh, let's see, uh, Dion, you got and Brian, you got two on the list. So Brian, we'll give you first question, and then Dion will have second. All right, so I. Uh, the Kansas Jayhawks, they have a rich tradition. It's one of the best basketball schools over decades of the, the sports history. So what was it like playing for that program in Lawrence, Kansas? It was uh, it was special. Like I said, I grew up in San Fernando Valley in Southern California, and I grew up a UCLA fan. I watched uh, uh, Kareem or Lou Alcindor, and then I watched Bill Walton. And, uh, you know, I was recruited by every college. Uh, I could have picked wherever I wanted to go, uh, and uh, everyone in the area uh, thought I was going to UCLA and because that's I would have been the next big there, uh, and we would have had a pretty good team with David uh, David Greenwood and Roy Hamilton and, and Kiki Vanderway, uh, guys in, in my era. Uh, and to this day, uh, I believe it was the year that John Wooden retired at UCLA to this day, I still have their letter of intent that when they came in, uh, Gene Barto took over. I have that letter of intent to UCLA. And if John Wooden would have came in my living room and said, Mo, we want you to come to UCLA, I probably would have signed. But I, but I went to Kansas because also growing up in LA, when I visited Lawrence, Kansas, it was the picture of a college campus. It has hills, it has red brick buildings. It has Allen Fieldhouse, the house that Wilt built. Um, and, and it was just everything I saw in a, in a college campus that I wanted. Uh, it was a small school, a small town, you know, 50,000 uh, when the school's not in session, 100 when it is. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, I, I loved my four years there. I was hurt my first two. Uh, went a lot, and actually, my junior year, we lost in the Western Regional against UCLA. That still hurts to this day. Um, but uh, I met my wife of 41 years there. Uh, I proposed to her in Allen Fieldhouse. And, uh, you know, it's still uh, in my heart uh, uh, today. Uh, Rock Chalk Jayhawk, for sure. 
Dion, go ahead. Hey, Coach Mo, um, you you coached my favorite team, the Dallas Mavericks, and got to see my favorite play, my favorite player, Dirk Nowinski. Um, my question for you is: After seeing the three ball dominate the NBA uh, the last couple of years, do you see it possibly going to back to a post game? I mean, we've seen like the taller players kind of dominate the game, like uh, the Joker, and possibly and be possibly getting the MVP this year. Um, although they aren't necessarily bigs, but guys like Kevin Durant has taken the lead and Giannis. Do you see the bigs possibly being the key in winning a championship? Well, I think, um, you know, people say that um, small ball is in and bigs are not uh, not valuable. I, I disagree with that. I mean, uh, 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 how tall is Durant? How, how tall is AD? How tall, how tall is the Joker? How tall is Giannis? How tall is Embiid? They're all seven foot tall. It's not small ball. They're seven foot players that can do more. And uh, I, I think the value of having a low post threat, scoring and passing is so valuable because teams, you know, everybody's running players off the three point line and doing that. But if you have to double the low post and he can kick it out, you can't close out fast enough. And I think those guys are so valuable. I wish more players would value uh, the low post play because I don't even care if you're a guard. You know who the some of the best low post players were Kobe Bryant and, and uh, Michael Jordan. They were unbelievable in the post. So uh, I, I hope that the low post game comes back because it's so it's hard to guard and it puts pressure on the defense in a different way. You know, you can run and shoot threes. You can swing the ball, draw and kick and shoot threes. But when you kick it into the post and then get it kicked right back out to you, those threes are so easy to knock down. So, uh, you know, with the success of, of Embiid and the Joker and guys like that uh, who can go in the low post, and then really one of the best teams in the NBA right now is the Phoenix Suns. And Aiton has jump hooks right and left and rolls to the basket. And they're the best team in the NBA right now. Unfortunately, Chris Paul is out, but uh, I, I don't undervalue that. And, and uh, I contest people that do say that it's all about small ball now. Paul. Well, I'm looking for Paul information and pictures and I stumble across this People Magazine, Sexiest Man Alive. <laughs> what kind of doors is that opening for you? Did your life change drastically? <laughs> Didn't you win it like multiple times? Weren't you up to like six? <laughs> I'm sure yeah, you have memorized. In someone's mind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, I was going to go into coaching for 20-something years at every level. But because I won that award, I went into modeling. And, uh, you know, you see my jockey ads and stuff and the billboards. And, you know, that changed my life in that way. <laughs> Kevin, go ahead. So you spent most of your career or, or, or as a player uh, in Milwaukee, it looks like. So kind of what was it like in Milwaukee and what kept you there um, that duration? Uh, yeah, they paid me. So that was good. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I, I was drafted in Houston playing behind Moses, and then I was traded to Detroit and uh, got to play when Isaiah was a rookie, but we weren't very good. Uh, and then I was traded to Cle Cleveland. Yeah, the city is okay, but the team was hell. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I was starting for Cleveland, and they cut me. As a starter, they cut me because they had 12 guaranteed contracts. So uh, I signed a I, – I had about five teams interested, uh, and I picked Milwaukee to sign a 10-day with because if you remember, here's a center that we didn't have on our list but should be in the, in the thing, Bob Lanier. And uh, Bob Lanier was at the end of his career in Milwaukee, and they didn't really have a backup. I'm going, hey, I could fit in there and slide in, you know, and be a big piece of that. And that's how I ended up there. And then when I started to play, I played for Don Nelson, who kind of thinks outside the box, but he's a player's coach. He played on those championship Celtic teams. And uh, he understood that if you have a guy with a big body that will play hard on defense, take charges, set picks, uh, do what he's supposed to do, know the plays, be ready to play, and be a good teammate, that those players are valuable to the team. 
They might not be Sidney Moncrief or Jack Sigma, but they're a key ingredient, and that's what I turned out to be. And uh, I just fit in Milwaukee because, uh, you know, people say I didn't look like a an athlete or, you know, I, you know any, if he can do it, I can do it. But, you know, I, I, I could shoot the three when I, when I needed to, and I just fit in with the team, but also with the community, kind of a, a – you know, uh, uh, Midwest kind of feel. And uh, it was so, I was so excited to see the Bucks win last year, not only for the Milwaukee Bucks, but for a small market. An NBA small market team can still win the championship. That's big. So we'll get you out of here with this. You're part of the D. Gerv and Big Mo Show. It's on Facebook Live Mondays at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. There's old shows on the YouTube, on YouTube channel as well in the archives. Tell us about your podcast uh, and, and what you guys do. Well, Derek Gervin is uh, Iceman Gervin's younger brother. Uh, Derek played in the NBA in New Jersey, played overseas for about eight or ten years. Uh, and we got together and decided we wanted to talk sports, mostly basketball, college, and um, NBA. But we do talk NFL a little bit because, we, you know, I'm a Packer fan and uh, you know, uh, we get at it a little bit, but, um, you know, we, we decided we wanted to talk about sports, answer people's questions, much like you guys are doing. And we wanted to bring on some guests that could really give some insight of, of what's going on. We've had, we've had Iceman Gervin, we've had Dr. J, we've had Jack Sigma, we've had Del Harris, Byron Scott. Uh, we've had uh, Mark Stein, who's an ESPN, former ESPN writer, and everybody gives their own insight on what's going on in the NBA and college basketball today. Everybody, make sure you check that out. Like I said, it's on Facebook Live, Mondays at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We want to thank Coach Mo, Paul Mokeski, for joining us tonight. Thank you for coming on, Paul. We appreciate that. I, I enjoyed it. You're talking my language, basketball and bigs. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> make sure everybody's watching. Hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on. We'll see you next time, everyone. Have a great night.